So good morning, everybody. I welcome you to the Orthopedic Grand Rounds. It's a very special uh, morning. Uh, we have a very interesting topic in this mini symposium format, I believe. Of all of the advancements of modern medicine, antibiotics are widely credited with being the number one achievement to incre increase survival of humankind. I very much think trauma care and good fracture fixation uh, would be the clear number two if, if only it was available more um, commonly and widely. Sadly, just like so many things in healthcare, good healthcare is equaled with high price, and unfortunately, high priced care is only available in the development or the developed world, and not in the developing countries, which is a majority of this world. And this is as recent as my residency in 1986 in Dallas, Texas, uh, where traction was performed. It was very much here in Seattle at Harvey with pioneers like Dr. Sigrid T. Hansen, who revolutionized trauma care in our country. Here to discuss not only the advancements of trauma care, but also the advancements in terms of uh, financing health care, uh, we have Dr. Henley, our professor of orthopedic surgery and trauma surgery, who is not just an MD, but also an MBA, and sits on many boards. I think there's not a more qualified orthopod to speak both about trauma care and about economics of health care. We're very privileged to have Dr. Lou Zirkel here, and he has been very dedicated, as you'll hear, to providing trauma care around the world. Yes, a single person can make a huge difference just by dedication and perseverance. And if you need any proof, these are slides from last night. And Dr. Zirkel um, did not want to have any fanciful dinners. He was at uh, heaven uh, being surrounded by residents. And he does the same thing around the world, as I could see in his recent sign conference. So we're very excited to have him and Dr. Henley here. To start us off is a gentleman, Dr. Ben Amos, PGY4. Uh, who heralds from the medical school of Southwest Medical Center in Dallas, Texas. I'm very proud of that. So Ben, take us to the show. Good morning, everyone. I'd like to welcome everybody to our Grand Rounds, entitled uh, All for One and One for Each, Evolving Low-Tech and High-Tech Options for Orthopedic Implants. Uh, I'd like to take just a second to discuss the title. It's both a play on the motto of the Three Musketeers, as well as a reference to doc that Dr. Zirkel will be talking about a single nail that's used to treat uh, femurs, tibias, and humeruses in almost any patient or fracture that you can find in the developing world. And Dr. Henley is going to discuss uh, modern implants that we're using in the United States to treat very specialized patients and very specialized fractures. Uh, we also noted low-tech and high-tech options, and that's not a reference to how technologically advanced the nails themselves are, but more the setting that they're used in. Dr. Zirkel is being used in low-tech uh, places where fluoroscopy and power are often not available, and Dr. Henley's being used in the most advanced centers in the world. Uh, I'd like to thank Dr. Henley and Dr. Zirkel for joining me on stage today, and I don't have any financial disclosures. And we'll start with two quick questions. Uh, this is a 24-year-old male that we actually treated at Harborview after a wakeboarding accident. He has a displaced uh, mid-shaft femur fracture, and uh, based on uh, just this simple fracture that uh, appears pretty well up there, and by a show of hands, we'll see who would want to treat this with more of a low-tech uh, maybe a less expensive option, and that'll be choice one. So anybody who would prefer that, just raise your hands. And that's good. And then the second option would be a more expensive high-tech nail. And then raise your hands. Okay, that's good. And a second question. Uh, this is the uh, Synthes Retrograde Integrate Femoral Nail Expert uh, system, and we uh, have prices for kind of all the nails that we'll, we'll present that a little bit later. But what would be your guess uh, for the price of a uh, Synthes uh, nail with three locking screws? So uh, start with 800, raise your hands. And 1200, raise your hands. And 1600, show of hands. And 2400, hands. And the last one is 2800. Okay, so uh, pretty close. The actual uh, price that was listed was $2,400. Um, so uh, I only have about 10 minutes to talk about the uh, very broad subject of intramedullary fixation, so it's going to be a, a very quick run through. Uh, we'll start with a, a brief history. The very first mention of a nail in any literature anywhere was by, uh, the, during the voyage of Hernando Cortez. Uh, the anthropologist on his visit uh, to the New World noticed uh, Aztecs using wooden dowels to treat uh, non-unions of femurs. Uh, any war brings along in advances in fracture care. In World War I, metallic devices were used, but due to high infection rates, uh, they fell out of favor. And Smith-Peterson, using uh, nails for femoral neck fractures, was the first person to really popularize intramedullary fixation. 
Uh, Gerhard Kuncher is the father of uh, modern intramedular layer fixation. He used a V-shaped nail in the 19, which was first described in 1940. And I think this is an interesting article from Time Magazine, which describes American soldiers returning from war and describing their experience to skeptical American doctors who eventually took x-rays, uh, which showed metal rods which had been uh, inserted into the canal of their femurs. Uh, reaming and interlocking screws were also introduced uh, early on, so all the uh, parts for our modern nails have been there since the 1950s. This is an example of an early nail. You can see it's short, it's straight. You can't insert it all the way down the uh, canal of the femur, and it has no uh, in interlocking screws. This is just a quick example of what happens with no interlocks. It's a comminuted displaced fracture with no rotational stability without interlocks, and you can see the rotational deformity on the right. Uh, just an example of some interlocks. And after uh, Kuncher, compression plating actually uh, became into favor, and there was, uh, that was mostly what was used in the 1960s, and some of the pioneering doctors here at Harborview, such as Dr. Hansen, Qualson, and Winquist, uh, helped to bring about the modern age of uh, intermedullary fixation. So here are a few current concepts I'm going to talk about. And this is just an, a, gener a generic list of indications for nails. Uh, I'm not going to bore you by talking about all of them, but the point of the slide is that the list of uses for nails is getting longer. Every few years, we're, advanced, we're getting new nails that are allowing us to treat more fractures uh, in a less invasive fashion. And the list of contraindications is actually getting shorter. And uh, uh, Dr. Uh, Henley is going to be addressing some of the modern advances that we're using to treat uh, more and more fractures. Most of the modern nails we use are made out of either titanium or 316L stainless steel. Uh, if, when you review the li literature, the main point is uh, that titanium actually has a closer modulus of elasticity uh, to cortical bone, but overall metallurgy is not a very important factor in uh, the use of nails. So one nail versus the other, so there's not a big difference. Um, current nails are actually straighter uh, than femurs. The femur has a radius of curvature of 100, approximately 120 degrees, and modern nails have a radius of curv curvature of a, about 150 to 300. Uh, sorry, not degrees, but centimeters. And basically it means that the nails are straighter, uh, which allows them to be inserted more easily, but they have less frictional stability. Uh, there's been a controversy over many years over ream versus uh, unream nailing. Uh, people said maybe reaming is not a good idea because of the negative effect on endosteal circulation, the possibility of thermal injury and, as well as fat embolization, and a second hit that polytrauma patients with thoracic injuries uh, might get and develop acute respiratory distress syndrome. Uh, but it allows for increased cortical contact, uh, the deposition of autograft at the fracture site, uh, and overall increased union rates. So currently reaming is the standard for most patients, but uh, for some borderline patients, uh, they may not tolerate it. Uh, this is just a quick review of starting points, for, mostly for the residents. Uh, the three main starting uh, points are the piriformis fossa, the greater trochanter, and a retrograde uh, fashion. The piriformis fossa is collinear with the long axis of the femoral shaft on the AP and lateral. And the important thing to remember is anterior translation causes large hoop stresses, which may cause an iatrogenic fracture. And uh, it's considered more difficult by some. And there's the worry of some possible abductor weakness due to the starting point. Uh, the greater trochanter is uh, just lateral to the long axis of the femur. Uh, this just, these uh, images over here just demonstrate that the tip of the trochanter is here. This starting point is actually lateral to it, and down here this starting point is medial. Uh, just a, one aspect to keep in mind. And due to the lateral starting point, uh, there was some historical uh, concern with uh, varus malalignment as well as comminution. Uh, but this has mostly been eliminated with modern uh, insertion techniques as well as the proximal lateral bend. This example of the retrograde starting point. Uh, Bloom and Sass line is one of the key uh, markers here. It's usually at the apex or just posterior to it, depending on the design of the nail. And uh, there's some concerns with knee pain, uh, as well as historically slightly lower union rates uh, with the retrograde starting point. And then we'll talk a little bit about just the markets. This is uh, maybe some information that uh, may be less familiar than the previous slides. Uh, this is numbers in the United States. Uh, in 2007, over 264,000 femurs were treated with internal fixation, 170,000 tibias, and so on and so forth. Uh, these numbers are relatively stable. But we do expect that to increase uh, over the next few years. 
Uh, the market for trauma implants, which includes nails, plates, screws, uh, was almost $3 billion in 2009, up 7.7% from 2008. And intramedullary devices alone account for almost $500 million um, dollars of that. And uh, I think it's just uh, one of the interesting facts is that nail accessories, such as end caps and locking screws, are about a third of that market as well. Here are the prices uh, for some of the modern nails. Uh, this is from a report on the market. And uh, you can see most of the nails are about $2,000 uh, to $2,500, and the locking screws are all seven, several hundred dollars each, and maybe even five or $600 in some cases. Just something to keep in mind when you're inserting your locking screws, and maybe they're a little bit long. That is an expensive mistake to make. And I guess the, one of the main uh, underlying uh, themes of this talk is with Dr. Zirkel and Dr. Henley is that uh, prices are increasing and that new, newer technologies are displacing older technologies with uh, sometimes uh, questionable benefit. Uh, over here on the right at the top is a DHS. Uh, the price of this is about $1,000. That was a little bit more than I was expecting. At the bottom is a Gamma 3 nail, which is about $3,000. And I think this is just one of the primary examples of uh, a technology that has uh, been taking uh, more of the market share with the Gamma 3 nail with some questionable ben benefits and uh, many fracture patterns. And I think that's going to be it for a, just a really quick run through through intramedullary fixation. Uh, I'd like to have Dr. Zirkel come to the stage right now to discuss his side nail and thank him for putting on the wonderful Sawbones last night that uh, I think all of us enjoyed. Thank you, Ben. It, it's a real honor for me to be here, and I thank all of the residents last night for an enjoyable Sawbones course. I'd like to start off with our vision statement, no matter what I'm talking about, because every decision we make at SIGN is based on our vision statement of creating a quality of fracture care throughout the world. The need for sign is increasing. 80% of severe fractures occur in developing countries, and these fractures are more severe than many of the fractures that we see. Urbanization has been a fact of life since man domesticated plants and animals. It's increasing now because of the economic conditions in developing countries, because more people are coming to the cities to try to get jobs, and there's a potpourri of different uh, modes of transportation and pedestrians on the street. This is the main culprit, which is a motorcycle. When they come to town, they first get a place to live and a job, and then next they have to get a transportation uh, mode. This is a $500 motorcycle. It's been developed in the last two years, and our trauma load has increased by 30%, probably due mostly to this motorcycle. It not only becomes the family vehicle, it becomes a mode of transportation for school children going back and forth. Young boys rent these by the day. They want to make as many trips as they can, and we've seen a big increase in pediatric femoral fractures. Disasters is another area of publicity when we, uh, as we've experienced in Haiti. This is in Pakistan, and these disasters demand immediate uh, good treatment as soon as possible because they're just like here at Harborview. They need to be treated on a timely basis. Terrorism is another cause of disability. In areas of conflict, the civilians are affected more than the combatants. Uh, I feel very strongly about this because I'm a Vietnam veteran, and we're in, we're in all of the civilian hospitals in Afghanistan, Iraq, and Pakistan. This slide is typical. This bomb went off very near where I was, but it killed street cleaners. These people were just out trying to earn money for their family in a very poor country, and 17 of them were killed. When a fracture occurs to a breadwinner, the, there's a spiral into poverty for three generations. These are WHO statistics. The children are taken out of school. The wife has to come in and care for the husband. And it's even worse when the wife is injured because the husband has to try to juggle the job and taking care of his wife. In the hospitals in developing countries, the food, the dressing changes, and many of the, much of the care of the patient has to be done 
by the family. So the whole family uh, process is disrupted. This is, the, the hospital system is dis disrupted when there's uh, many fractures, and this is occurring more and more. I was making rounds in this hospital in Tanzania when we went on to the next bed when a voice came out from under a bed, hey, don't forget me. So you can see that there's many, many people in the hospitals. They plug up the beds, and therefore the hospital system has helped if you can get these patients out of bed. We don't have an arc of radius. These are the canals, so we have studied the canals rather than the outside of the femur. Most of the studies have been done using museum specimens on the outside of the femur. But we found that a straight nail fits it very well. We have to uh, treat femurs from all around the world, therefore we had to be sure that we could fit these femurs, and so we decided not to use an arc of radius. We don't have much malunion using the arc of radius. There's about sometimes as much as seven degrees of recurvatum, but clinically it's not a problem. Uh, the sign nail was then used uh, in the humerus uh, in India. In India, it's very important that they get their hands to the mouth. This nail is a little long. We've since made shorter nails. And this is our sign set. Uh, the set can be used for the tibia, the retrograde approach to the femur, the anti-grade approach to the femur, and the humerus. It's made of stainless steel. We started off with stainless steel because it was the bar stock we could get. And we're very happy now, in retrospect, uh, I had a slide showing it's better to be lucky than smart. Uh, and usually you may refer that to other people, but we refer that to ourselves. Uh, there's less infection. There's more biofilm adherence to titanium alloy than there is to stainless steel, and we have a very low infection rate. We have solved the problem of not doing interlock um, with a C-arm. We don't need a C-arm because they don't have a C-arm. And last night we learned that in the sawbones. I would challenge anybody in the world to, in terms of accuracy and speed of interlock, they can use a C arm and we won't. The slots of the nail have worked out well. We needed the slots of the nail in order to do our interlock, but we now have a compression and distraction so the fractures heal faster. Uh, you saw a picture of the reamers. We had to use hand reamers. We started off with a pilot reamer, which is sharp, and then we used the blunt reamer. The blunt reamer is good for determining the length of the nail needed. But we can get the bone graft from that reamer, and it's very apropos for uh, bone grafting the fracture. It's, uh, you can get as much bone graft from the reamer uh, as you can from the iliac crest. Uh, in the September, clinical orthopedics, there was an article about the second hit. The second hit occurs in patients with head injuries and thoracic injuries, and we found that there's less second hit. This was an article comparing ream nails to unream nails. Well, ours is a hand ream nail. There's been no studies, and we have not known a second hit. We used our idea of the fin nail, uh, which can come into, which interdigitates with the uh, femur at the isthmus. Uh, this was again lucky than smart. I was in Cambodia trying to catch a plane. I hung up a reamer. After a few close words, uh, I uh, thought, boy, this would be a good interlock. And so we've developed this. We've done 760 fin nails around the world with good results, and we're studying this. We can do it retrograde, and we can do it anti-grade, and this is an example of our database. Uh, when I s suspect something might not be quite right, I say, I'd like you to send a follow-up, and they send a follow-up, but we go by the clinical effect rather than the x-ray effect. I thought this nail would be too short, and now we're finding out and studying how long a fin nail needs to be. We're FDA approved because the people in developing countries need to have that seal of approval that we have here in the United States. It costs us about 10% more, but we feel like it's worth it for their peace of mind. When we talk about systems, high tech, low tech, and I don't know which system you're referring to, we have to consider the surgeon. 
The implant system can't put the nail in, but the implant plus the surgeon puts it in. And so we have changed our technique uh, to uh, accommodate not having to make design changes in the nail. This uh, was an Af a picture of Afghanistan. The United States military spends $200 million on the Afghan military. I'm in their main hospital using a hacksaw to cut the bone and a commercial drill to drill the holes. We started off with a hand drill because we're in Vietnam where the uh, bone is soft, and then we went to the harder bone places, and Afghanistan is one of them, so we have to use a power drill. We decided that we could not accept the possibility of infection, so we made a drill cover and a, a sterilizable chuck extension, which works very well. And it worked very well in Haiti, where uh, we didn't have good sterilization facilities. Our sign surgeons, and I give them complete credit, uh, have pushed the envelope. There's 6,000 sign surgeons around the world. They're, they're using our nail to treat these kind of fractures. So we developed a hip fixation device. We did a lot of bench testing. Uh, Dr. Tenser here at University of Washington gave us uh, ideas about this. And we started off very crudely with load to failure uh, bench tests. And we learned a lot from this. And then. Uh, uh, an engineer, medical student from UW showed up one day, and another engineer showed up uh, two days later. They're both working in Seattle, and they devised this in two months to test our hips for fatigue. And that's a very important test to do with bench testing. They since presented this fixture at the ASTM and it may become the standard for ASTM uh, testing of hip implants. This is the result. It looks unusual. We now have 150 surgeries, and none of them have lost reduction. One of the problems is that sometimes we don't get complete reductions in the beginning, uh, but we're finding that we're getting better. This is our distractor. We started off uh, devising this in Pakistan because the fractures became uh, telescoped. They're hard to get out to length. This uses two clamps and it works very well, we've got to revise the clamps. You know, in orthopedic surgery, we haven't made any new clamps for uh, years and years and years. We're all around the world. We've done 70,000 surgeries around the world. Uh, our results are very good. They're all they're listed on our database. If you can't evaluate your pr process, you can't manage it. Thank you very much. Okay, thank you very much. You've heard about the high-tech nail that Sign puts out and uses in a low-tech environment. I'm going to talk to you about the evolution of the nail and how technology continues to improve quality. I have a lot of disclosures. As you'll see at the top, I receive royalties from some orthopedic equipment companies which make intermedullary implants, and I'm a paid speaker for uh, three of the companies which also make implants such as nails. This information is publicly disclosed as is for all orthopedic surgeons on the American Academy of Surgeons website and you can find out disclosures of any uh, physician who's a member who has put that in. So technologic innovations have improved the quality of care. You saw first that straight nails cause problems but solutions were found and curved and bowed nails were the result. Next were control of length and rotation by interlocking and a way to maintain your reduction. As we have evolved the, the technology of nails, we're able to treat fractures more and more towards the ends of the long bone. I believe that one shape, one bend, one bow is not for all. You can see that we're very diverse in this world with a multitude of different femoral shapes and sizes. As Dr. Amos showed, straight nails, such as you see on the left, probably couldn't be inserted further, and those sign nails are a little more flexible. Newer nails come in differing radii of curvature, as you see on the right. This is a slide from about 10 years ago, and if you look at the C-arm shot in the bottom, you will see that the nail is out the front. And you can see we're studying the shape of the nail, which we had removed, 
Kunchner used to bend nails interoperatively because they didn't come pre-bent, they were straight, and you can see that uh, a group of us are bending that nail in situ in the OR to re-sterilize it and re-implant it so as to repair that uh, trajectory that you saw on the C-arm. Now, as nails have evolved, generally most nails on the market come in one radius of curvature. However, as you see to the left, people come in different sizes and shapes, and you have um, some people with very straight bones because they're long, and others that are shorter who have more curved bones. Also, different ethnicities in the world have different uh, shaped bones, and one uh, company's nail comes in a variety of radii depending on its length so as to fit those who are both large and small. The simple locks were the first thing as a technologic advance to control rotation. First we controlled just the subtrochanteric and shaft portion, and then when the screws were inserted up the neck into the head, you could control for fractures that were more proximal, such as high subtrochs and intertrochs. Cephalomedullary nails are the sort of newest advance, and Dr. Ema showed you the prices of those, and they're used to treat geriatric fractures. They are larger in diameter in the intertrochanteric region in order to fill that osteoporotic vo void, and are also helpful in treating reverse obliquity subtroch fractures such as you see here. Now the main problems with intertrochanteric and pertrochanteric fractures are shortening, which can be overcome by traction, varus, which in part can be solved with positioning the limb and controlling accurately your starting point. Rotational control, and that is solved with a keyed screw, such as the dynamic hip screw or the sliding screw, or using a spiral blade, or two fixation devices into the neck and head. As you see on the right, um, there, this is a relatively new implant. Again, I will try not to advocate for any manufacturer and will try not to name either implants or the manufacturers. But what this does is allow the offset between possible neck and shaft fractures or greater trochanteric and neck fractures to be compressed through this uh, dual screw mechanism. And here, as you can see, uh, the same case with implantation of this device and a nice fracture with good rotational control and compression across the proximal fractures. Retrograde nails were another technological advance which Dr. Amos touched on, which allow you to treat ipsilateral fractures of the femoral neck and the shaft. As you can see on the left, you have a uh, fracture involving the femoral neck, which is difficult to see, and a comminuted fracture of the shaft, which was treated by two different implants, three screws for the femoral neck with an anatomical reduction, and a retrograde locked nail. Retrograde nails also allow the treatment of low femoral fractures. They come in a variety of types. The early nails had just uh, transverse screws, which could adequately control for fairly stable fractures in non-osteoporotic bone, as you see uh, in the examples on the bottom right. So the simple fixation were generally two screws, trans transverse locked, which controlled these fractures well in dense bone. Periprosthetic fractures oftentimes are controlled with retrograde nails and are a technologic advance as they allow insertion into the box in between the two femoral runners of these and in this osteoporotic bone there's a multitude of locks in this short nail which will control this fracture. So the innovations coming to uh, market are replacing these two transverse screws with additional screws that target the distal femoral condyles, especially into the dense bone in the posterior condyles. These can be used also in total knees or periprosthetic fractures targeting the dense posterior bone. Here's an example of a tibial plateau fracture and a shaft with intraarticular extension. The advantages of multiplanar screws are that once this fracture is stabilized with compression screws, a nail can be inserted to stabilize the shaft and control it well through healing. Similarly, tibial fractures can be treated in the distal third, and you can see this fracture is, involves both the tibial shaft and the tibial pilon with a very distal fracture in the ankle, which extends interarticularly. 
The newer nails treat fractures at the periphery of the bone, allowing screws to be inserted essentially five millimeters from the end of the nail uh, to control both the shaft fracture and the pilon fracture, as you see on uh, the implanted slides to the right. Through these technologic innovations, we have improved the quality of care. What I'm going to talk about towards the end here is differentiation of specific nails for specific indications. There are new developments involving adolescent nails, which attempt to avoid open growth plates, and uh, nails that are directed towards the increasingly older population and the complications one sees in orthopedic surgery. Keith Willett of uh, the UK termed these the orthopedic oops, and the oops are those diagnoses which will become more prevalent as you uh, go into practice. That includes osteoporosis, obesity, periprosthetic fractures, and sepsis or infection, and I'd like to touch on these innovations quite briefly. First of all, the differentiation in adolescence. These are special nails which have a lateral uh, entry point and avoid both the capital femoral epiphysis and the distal femoral epiphysis. You can see on the right, this was treated by a lateral entry nail with excellent healing and maintenance of uh, growth through the capital physis and the distal femoral physis. Another differentiation is for osteoporosis. And you, I alluded to this with multiple points of fixation and multiple planes of fixation with the addition of bolts, nuts, and washers, and fixed angle screws. So if you see on the right, for example, these fixed angle screws are threaded into the nail and allow for rigid control of for exi this example, this proximal tibial fracture. You'll also see the multiple points of control in the slide I previously showed. This is a failed uh, distal femoral locking plate. You can see broken screws here and distally with this beginning to fall into varus. And this was treated with these multi-planar screws, bolts with nuts, there are two transverse bolts with nuts and conical washers, and instrumentation for obesity. You notice you don't see the soft tissues of this, in, this individual on the x-ray, nor do you see it. You get a better size of her girth on this lateral of the knee, and you can see the multiple points of fixation with two oblique screws, one being inserted from lateral to medial, and the other one from medial to lateral. These are not direct. This is another manufacturer's implant that's not directed at the posterior femoral condyles. There are technologic advances in differentiation for obesity, and that instrumentation has allowed for longer guides. Most of these nails are inserted with minimal incisions or percutaneously. The guides are longer, so you can start higher and do this more percutaneously. They're wider, so that they clear the greater soft tissues as America becomes more obese. And the, in order to make sure that the proximal screws target the nail, the tolerances of manufacturing have had to be improved. What about for infection and tumors? Well, there will be new nails coming on the market which have antiseptic coatings. These include periapatite, hydroxyapatite, and most recently, elemental nanoparticles. These are going through FDA approval, and nails are anodized or covered with either silver or copper. We also use uh, nails which can be covered with cement to deliver antibiotics or can make a, a homemade nail with cement. One of our fellows designed a nail which has yet to be marketed. It's an antibiotic eluding nail or a catheter nail, which you can see the patent there. The cross section's on the left. It has four grooves in it to allow introduction of a catheter and delivery of antibiotics or um, anti-cancer drugs to the site of a pathologic fracture. And you can see the catheters are inserted in the grooves along the side. There's instrumentation that goes along this with this, which was de developed by another individual. And the catheter, this being the black squiggly line, is inserted along the, the grooves in the guide, into the grooves in the nail, and then is tunneled under the skin percutaneously to allow infusion of antibiotics or drugs at um, a fracture site or uh, a, a metastasis. Newer nails are being developed which are highly differentiated in order to treat tough periprosthetic fractures. It's fairly easy to treat these Vancouver type C, C fractures which are distal to a femoral stem with a plate or even a retrograde nail that ends up 
uh, below the total hip. The most difficult ones to treat are the three in the center, which are the Vancouver B types, one with a, a well-fixed stem, uh, and that's uh, B1 here, and B2 and B3 with either bone deficiency or loose stems. What has been developed for these are uh, locking implants and antibiotic nails. This is a case of an infected Vancouver B3, which had a nail, excuse me, hip extraction in 2008 and was associated with a infected periprosthetic fracture, which you can see distally. This was treated temporarily with an antibiotic nail, homemade. This is a, a reconstruction nail that was inserted down the medullary canal. You can see the bone that has been resected here in the lateral cortex. That nail had its two proximal screws placed up towards the femoral neck and then a, a methamethacrylate plug impregnated with antibiotic formed a femoral head over which a cup was placed. This maintained limb length with delivery of high dose antibiotics to the uh, infection site. After this had healed, the patient was taken back for a secondary procedure with a specialized uh, implant, which looks much like a hybrid between a total hip stem and an intermedullary nail. You can see on the left, it allows for interlocking. You can see the, the uh, the healing picture on the right after addition of allograft, which is uh, in this for the bone removed of the lateral cortex immediately. There are other implants, uh, revision stems, which allow for cross-locking. And although this one was done with cerclage wires, there is a locking screw you can see at the bottom here using this implant. Lastly, it's been many years since uh, people have tried to mate intermedullary nails in a retrograde fashion for either um, periprosthetic fractures or pathologic fractures as you see in this one. This was treated many years ago by a uh, nail which was advanced in a retrograde fashion to mate with the distal stem which was uh, essentially a, a well-fixed Vancouver B1 stem. And here's another one also taken from several years ago showing a retrograde nail that's been placed to interdigitate with a stem. So these are the technologic innovations that are coming to market and will be refined. This is, we are seeing increasing quality of patient care through design. We can treat diverse diagnoses, diverse ent entities, and different deformities. So one nail for each, not one for all. Thank you very much. We have one last ARS question by a show of hands. Which of these technologic advances do you think uh, will have the greatest impact on fracture care? And you please vote once. Uh, antiseptic nails. Okay, periprosthetic nailing systems. Instrumentation for obesity and minimal invasive insertion. Fixed angle locking screws for osteoporosis. And adolescent nails. So two, three, and four is we're about equal. Thank you again. Okay, we've got, we've got about 10 or 15 minutes left for discussion and questions. I think we'll have Dr. Zirkel and Henley come up. Uh, and I, We've got one question uh, for Dr. Zirkel, and we already discussed the prices of all these other nails, but we'd uh, like to ask Dr. Zirkel uh, what the cost of uh, his sign nail is. Uh, when you talk about a burden cost versus uh, cost of labor and materials, our burden cost is, is about $160. I'd, I'd like to say one thing about the, the proximal end. It didn't show up on my slide. Um, there, the proximal end of the femur is a helix, helix. And if you have a smaller end, you can slide down that helix like you slide down a slide. A kid slides down a slide. If you have a larger end, no matter what the final uh, configuration is, uh, I don't think you slide down that as well. And we haven't had uh, problems with our proximal femur fractures uh, with one nail. Can, can you also answer how you <clears throat> distribute the nail to your centers and the cost of those centers of the, these implants? We distribute our nail in response to the reports on the database. When, we re when they reach 20 reports, they have to include pre- and post-op x-rays, 
and they have to send a percentage of follow-up x-rays, then we ship to them. We, we donate to the majority of our programs. Dr. Zirkel, you deserve a lot of uh, credit for having single-handedly launched this global vision and actually affecting trauma care around the world uh, very uh, foundationally. One question that I have is, again, going back to the pricing. When I talk to U.S. manufacturers about the implant costs, they break down the high cost of the implants as follows. They say roughly 30% is for R&D, for research and development. 30% is for legal coverage, uh, legal more or less backstops. About 20% is for storage and uh, for distribution, leaving about 20% as a profit margin, and some manufacturers claim it's only 10%. This is how a roughly, let's say, uh, $3,000 implant is broken down. Where's the fat and where do you see this enormous price difference between a $150 or, let's say, $300 device compared to a $3,000 device. What have you trimmed? Well, I don't take any salary or expenses, and I do a lot of the design work. Um, we pay our 29 employees uh, a very competitive wage. Uh, I, I think, one, if you define research, you have to define it as effective research. Uh, in, in terms of new ideas and new uh, ways to uh, solve different fractures. We have now 6,000 sign surgeons around the world with the diversity of ideas. So we get a lot of free labor, basically, in response to our, our sign. Uh, I, I can't comment on shipping. We don't have the legal problems, expenses. I'll follow that up with one more question. So Dr. Henley's response to the use of highly specialized uh, implants, or, was, or high tech implants as we call them, was that we have all these problem fractures and um, problem injuries that require highly de uh, refined, um, highly designed uh, devices. Um, Dr. Amos, maybe you can answer that because you did the survey. What is the actual incidence of highly complex fractures, let's say in North America, and what is the incidence of run-of-the-mill fractures where you might not need such a high-tech device? Um, the, the surveys I saw didn't address it, fracture types as far as breaking them down to complex versus simple, so I mean, I, I, I'm not sure. May I ask Dr. Henley, out of your large clinical experience, how, what percentage of our general femur fractures, using femur fractures, requires a high-tech device and what could we actually get away with with a very simple, uh, regular, routine, uh, trusted uh, nailing device such as presented by Dr. Zirkel? My personal perspective is that the vast majority of femoral fractures involve the shaft and are amenable to a relatively simple device, one that allows for alignment of the canal and interlocking. I think in the elderly population, especially as we age, we'll see more fractures involving the proximal femur, which will be more difficult to treat with a simple device. But if you're asking specifically about the shaft of the femur, most of those are amenable to a very simple nail without uh, all the technologic advances. Proximal femora are a little different and require um, a more technologically advanced implant. Any other questions? Dr. Anson, can you come to a microphone, please? Since you're kind of the, the pioneer of nailing. Dr. Hansen, would you have ethical problems with us, for instance, switching to a sign nail for the fixation of routine femur fractures? Ethical problems? Yeah. Why should we not switch to, uh, for instance, a routine uh, femur fracture fixation with a device like a sign nail, for instance? Uh, I don't see any ethical problem with that. Uh, I, I see the ethical problem on the other side with the uh, continuing race to make a better color and a better shape and all the things and driving the cost up. Are, we're being very entrepreneurial. I, I personally would have uh, stuck with the, when the, they came out with the um, universal nail, you can do most of that, uh, most everything with that, plus a little innovation with other things that we have. I'm not big on this uh, race to be have the fanciest, most expensive, most colorful nail at all. I think we've really gone the wrong direction. Part of the problem is that equipment companies stop producing the simple nails in a terms of uh, built-in obsolescence, and they force you and physicians 
to buy their newer nail because they make unavailable, quit manufacturing the older style implants. That's exactly what I mean. Yeah. It's all about money. So then, Dr. Zirkel, the question comes back to you. Dr. Hansen has just said there's no problem with using your type of a device in North America. Are you distributing in North America? Could North American centers uh, ask for your nail to be used? And would your implant prices have to go up because you suddenly have a legal problem? We uh, use our nail in our local hospital in the Tri-Cities. Uh, we don't have a distribution staff. I, I, someone would have to do that. I, I don't have the time uh, <laughs> to do that. That's, that's not exactly what I said. I wouldn't necessarily switch to that. I didn't see an ethical problem with it, what you asked me. Do you see a clinical problem then? If I can pin you down. Uh, clinical, you know, we, we've been through the small nail thing in the past. That's where we started with the, uh, the Hanson Street nail, which is no, it's not in my nail, by the way, it's before that, but, and some of the other small nails. They, we had a lot of fractures of the nail in the, in the early years with smaller nails. Uh, so the larger ones were developed, and then once they got larger and uh, curved at a reasonable average curve, and then uh, in, and, uh, you could cross-lock them, uh, from then on, the, the, uh, the improvements were mostly money-driven and competition-driven and not much driven by surgeons' need, in my opinion. But, you know, I haven't done trauma for now 20 years, but uh, I don't see that things have changed that much in terms of what we, we were dealing with, everything that came in. And Harborview has the, if you're going to have the complex fractures, that's where you get them. But we can still do them with some little additions, most of them, to the basic nails. I'd just like to comment that the sign nail, I don't believe, is a low-tech nail. Uh, Dr. Zirkel, can you tell us how many different sizes, diameters, and lengths they come in? Thank you. Well, we're, we have length from 200 millimeters up to 420 millimeters. We have widths from 7 millimeters to 12 millimeters. So we do have an assortment of sizes, and we noticed that uh, in different parts of the world, there are different lengths and different hardnesses of bone. Uh, as for a breakage of the nail, we've only had about 10, 10 breakages out of 70,000. So to to uh, address Dr. Hansen's concern, they do come in fairly large diameters, 10s, 11s, and 12s, and those are the size which we use conventionally with uh, newer nails. Dr. Zirkel, have you received any help from any of the larger foundations that uh, espouse uh, global health improvement as their goals? Uh, we supply the orthopedics to Doctors Without Borders, MSF, to a, an Italian NGO called Emergency. Those are the uh, NGOs that we work with. Uh, the implant companies uh, give us a sponsorship at the sign conference for surgeons to come from developing countries to attend our meetings. Okay. Thank you very much. Thank you.